Okay, all right. Well, if you've got a Bible, we're going to turn to the book of Numbers and chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. While you're turning there, let me just tell you this, that, that in every person's life, there are two crossings that they have to make. Okay, there are two. And the first crossing that every person has to make, and eternity rests on this, is that we must come out of what is um, signified in the Bible by the nation of Israel leaving Egypt. But Egypt is a picture of the world. And everybody has to leave their bondage to the world, surrender their life to Jesus, and come out into the glorious freedom of the children of God, whom the Son sets free, is what the Bible says. So there is a real moment of freedom when you find Jesus. And we have to experience that. We have to cross what is figuratively described by Israel as the Red Sea. That's a picture of baptism. And we have to come out of the world and we have to come under the Lordship of Jesus. Then we are truly God's children and we are free. We're free. That's amazing. If you're free, why don't you take about three seconds and praise God that He sets you free. God sets you free. I'm free not because I'm intelligent, good looking, or because I've done a lot of good deeds. Hopefully I am all three. Shut up. But I am free because of the sacrifice of Jesus. The second crossing I have to make though is signified in the Bible by the Israelites leaving the wilderness, crossing the Jordan River. The Red Sea, the first one. The Jordan River, the second one. To leave an arid wilderness and to step into the promises of God. There are many people who do the first but don't do the second. They live in the freedom of God, but they don't live in the promises of God. I'm going to help you understand why in this series. And God wants us to be people that step into everything that He has for us. Can, I, can you say amen to that? The first crossing is empowered beginning to end by God Himself, Jesus. The blood of the Lamb was over the doors of the Israelite people. And now, because of the sacrifice and the blood of Jesus shed for us, we can be forgiven. All I need to do is acknowledge His sacrifice, repent of my sin, surrender to Him, and He does everything else from God. Our salvation is by grace through faith from beginning to end. If you're grateful for that, come on. Praise God right now. The second crossing, though, is empowered by God, but it's enabled by faith and obedience. And this is the difference. Why some cross and others don't. is because the second crossing, the priests of Israel stepped into the flood waters of the Jordan. God could have sent them over the Jordan River anytime. And most of the year, I've been to the River Jordan, and most of the year, it's just a little bit of a trickle. But kind of like the Hutt Valley River here in Wellington, there are seasons when it rains and it becomes a torrent. And when God said cross was not when it was a trickle, but when it was a torrential force. Why? Because sometimes when God wants you to do something great for His name, He doesn't just make every step easy because if you do it, you'll discover that it's not you doing it, but the power of God that is at work to orchestrate and ordain that is doing it through you as you take steps of faith and obedience. So the Bible says the Israelites would, the priests would take a step and their feet would get wet and then the waters would recede. Their feet would get wet and the waters would recede. They crossed the Red Sea on dry ground, but they crossed the Jordan River with wet shoes. And if we're not willing to take steps of faith and obedience, then we can miss out. If we're going to be a entering generation, then we're going to have to embrace some wet feet, some factual uncertainty, some steps of obedience that defy natural logic. We're going to have to go where it is uncomfortable to go. Tap three people and tell them that was for you, not for me. Just tell them that was for you. And as God was getting ready to send Israel into the promised land, on the eve of that moment, they sent 12 spies to check out the land that was on the other side. 12 spies. So they were slaves in Egypt. One year they crossed the wilderness. They reached the edge of the Jordan River and they send over 12 spies. By the way, can I help you for a second? 
Let me, let me help you for a second. The 12 spies were not in God's original plan. If you read the book of Deuteronomy, you'll discover that the Israelite people asked for the spies. They said, we don't know what's on the other side. Could you send 12 spies? And as a concession to their faithlessness and their fear, God said, okay, send the 12 spies. The lesson that we need to learn from that is sometimes we need to become less aware of the circumstantial pressure and more aware of the instruction of God. Sometimes people want to know everything before they do it. And sometimes says, God says, do it. And then one day I might tell you how you did it. We need a generation that are willing to step beyond even when it doesn't make sense to do so. Somebody, somebody give God some praise right now. So these 12 spies, these 12 spies, these 12 spies, they were sent to survey the land that was on the other side of the Jordan River, commissioned, commissioned by Moses to go and to see it and to bring back a report. And today, before we even get to the book of Joshua, I want to camp around what happened with these 12 spies. If you have a Bible, we're going to go to the book of Numbers chapter 13, and we're going to start reading today in verse 26. As we start to read this, I don't normally do this, but I actually felt in prayer to do this this week. So we're going to do it. And if you don't like it, tough. Um, I got the microphone, so in, in every location, could you just do something? We've never done this before at Rice, but could you stand your feet while we read the Bible? I just feel like sometimes we allow the reading of the Bible to become an equal part of the message. Whereas this is actually, you can guarantee everything that's about to be said right now is the inspired Word of God. Um, by the way, great moment to turn your phone on flight mode, by the way. No one wants to acknowledge that? Did you hear me? It's a good moment to turn your phone on flight mode. I'm going to do it myself. Verse 26. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. And there they reported to them and showed them the whole assembly, uh, reported the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified and very large. And we even saw the descendants of Anak there, the Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites, Mosquito Bites and Muesli Bites live in the hill country and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. And then Moses silenced the people before, sorry, Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land. We can certainly do it. I love a guy who's certain about what he can't be certain about. But the people who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. The Nephilim are there. It's like inspiring the boogeyman. All the descendants of Anak come for the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we looked the same to them. God, I just pray that today you'd use the journey of these 12 spies to speak to us. Speak to me, speak to every person. Anoint this message. Help me to say what you want me to say. And I haven't preached for a while, Lord, so help me to not say the 50,000 things I'm going to think of that I'm not supposed to say. In Jesus' name, bless this word. Amen. Amen. Why don't you slap a high five with three people and grab a seat. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> the Israelites were God's chosen people. They still are. They were God's chosen people. They began with one man by the name of Abraham, whose journey jumps into the Scripture in Genesis chapter 12. We've only had 11 chapters of the Bible, and suddenly it's all about the story of the nation that came from Abraham. They were God's chosen people when they were a family tribe of 120 people who went down into Egypt. They were God's chosen people while they were in Egypt. They were God's chosen people when they came up out of Egypt with 800,000 fighting men in their number. All the way through, they were God's chosen people. But 
For 400 years, God's chosen people lived as slaves in the nation of Egypt. I need you to understand that they were God's chosen people, yet God's chosen people were beaten and oppressed by Egyptian slave masters. They were God's chosen people, yet the life that they lived was not easy. It was exceptionally difficult. They were God's chosen people, but they lived for 400 years with pain and with hardship. I think sometimes we need to remember that. Because there are moments in our Christian journey where it feels like, to me, people begin to think God doesn't love them the moment difficulty happens in their life. Friends, I need you to understand that God loves you, but that doesn't mean that this world does. It doesn't mean we live in a world where everything is going to be tiptoeing through the tulips all of the time. We live in a world where things don't always happen the way that we want. And Israel, with God's chosen people, and they would come to the Sabbath, and they would worship, and they would read the Scriptures, and they would sing the songs. I'm going to see your victory. I'm going to see your victory. If my voice doesn't sound good in all those campuses everywhere, it's because the sound engineer is doing something to my voice. It's got nothing to do with my singing ability. I just wanted you to know that. Actually, when I sing in the shower, I sound amazing. I'm going to see your victory. You want more of that? Yeah. (laughs) They would worship on the Sunday, and they would hear that they were God's chosen people. And then on Monday, they were having their backs beaten by an Egyptian slave master. And they lived their lives with two realities. A Sunday reality, a God's chosen people reality, and a Monday reality, a hardship and oppression reality. They lived their lives with God's chosen person me and beaten and downtrodden me. And the truth is, friend, for every single one of us, we all actually do this at some level. I don't know how long you've been a follower of Jesus. Maybe it's only been a week or month, and maybe you've come out of all kinds of different things. And the truth is, maybe you've only had until you found Jesus one reality. Maybe it's been the the difficulty of your past or the pain that you've been through or the drugs that you're addicted to or the problems in your life or the dysfunction of your family or the neglect of your experiences or maybe it's been the failure of your school paradigm and you thought that's all you were and now you've discovered Jesus. I know, I know because I know what happened to me at the age of 18. A little flicker of a seed is beginning to grow on the inside of you, that fledgling, and I promise you it'll become a tree that you'll begin to see that you're not just the the rejection of your past or the failure of your school experience, but you're actually a child of God and that there's promise on the inside of you and destiny ahead of you and uniqueness God's put on the inside of you. Oh, if you believe every person on this planet is chosen and selected by God, why don't you praise God for His goodness? Come on, that's the God that we worship. Two realities, two identities. They had, they had church them and Monday them. And we all do that. I mean, we've all, we all know how to do the good church me, right? Walk into church on Sunday. Walk into that foyer. There's that family that you don't really like that much because everything seems too easy for them. And their kids are all actually well-dressed and smiling. And, you know, it just seems like they haven't broken a sweat to get to church. You know, and then you've had like this awful morning and it's been like this fight just to get out the door and... The car didn't have petrol, and then you're blaming everybody else for that, and finally made it to church, walked in five minutes late, and they're like, hey, how you doing? And you're like, awesome. (laughs) And then there's Monday you, where we walk into pain, and we walk into difficulty, or we have problems at work. We have, we have the promises that we sing on Sunday, and we have the failure that we live on Monday, and we can, we can live like that for a while, for a season. We can live like that. In fact, most people live with two realities, two identities. But the truth is, in our lives, you're going to believe one and you're going to fake the other. One's going to win out and the other one is going to be something that you manufacture in order to have the semblance that you need for the situations you find yourself in. And Israel had two realities. 
they walk in a church and hear the promises of the rabbi and then they would step out and hear the, the, the scorn and the despisement of the Egyptian slave master and two realities are now competing and one they're going to believe and the other they're going to fake. And when circumstances are difficult, when situations are not easy, when you're not winning every day and you aren't just growing in Instagram followers by 500 before breakfast, you can be trapped into believing what the Egyptian says and not what the Word of God says. Listening to the voices of the Word, world, and not the voices of God, the voice of God. And so in our lives, this becomes a trap because these years of slavery for Israel have been painful and difficult. And unavoidable. Unavoidable. See, friends, I need you to understand about your life that God won't take you anywhere in your life that you're not ready for yet. I didn't say you'd feel ready, but He won't take you there before you are ready. And if God's going to take you into something, He's going to make sure you're ready before you get there. Remember that before God created Adam and Eve, He never sent rain on the land. The book of Genesis tells us that until they were there to cultivate what was going to grow when the rain began to fall, that he did not send rain because there was no one there to cultivate it. In other words, before you're ready for it, God won't give it to you. And God wasn't going to send a family tribe of 120 people to conquer the entire promised land that was full of the muesli bites and mosquito bites and Hittites and Amazites and Amaronianzites, I don't know, Amazonites. <laughs> There's people who shop a lot on Amazon. He wasn't, he wasn't going to send them over to conquer a land when there were only 120 people. He waited until they had an army of 800,000. But how do you do that? How do you keep them as a people that are separated and unique while you're allowing them to expand and grow? And the truth is, what seemed like the most horrible of circumstances was actually a plan to get them to where they needed to go. The Egyptians despised the Israelites, so they refused to intermarry with them. So their national identity was preserved. But they valued them because of the work they were doing, so they never killed them or destroyed them. And a nation of 120 became a nation with 800,000 fighting men in a position that looked like everything was stacked against them. And I, I say that to say this, that sometimes when it doesn't make sense in our lives, God's still moving. And if what you're going through in your life is looking horrible, then know this, God isn't finished yet. And in the middle, yeah, come on, give God some praise. I'm going to see a victory because the battle does belong to, the God, to God. And we should not listen to the voice of the world and the voice of our inferiority. We need to make sure that we're listening to Him. In the middle of our trial, don't lose heart because the circumstances we're facing seem to be so difficult and we'd rather not go through it and never lose sight of who you are even in the most difficult of circumstances. Come on, somebody give God some praise. Your season of slavery might be God's season of preparation. They came up out of Egypt, they crossed the Red Sea, and then they were in the wilderness. They came out, they were finally free. They came out, they were still the same people. They were finally free, but they were still the same people. And the thing about us is that we can come to know Jesus, but you don't park your identity at the door. Two realities. God's chosen one and the rejected one. Two identities. You will believe one and you will fake the other. They were called to cross the Jordan River and to step into the promised land. And friends, if you've ever doubted the suddenly power of God, consider the fact that a nation have been slaves for 400 years. And after only one year, they went from being a slave, having the Egyptians sealed 
back from them by the Red Sea. And one year later, they're standing on the edge of the Jordan River and about to inherit the most choice piece of real estate in the known world at the time. I'm here to tell you that in one year in your life, God does have the power to suddenly move in a way that is supernatural. Suddenly to bring a healing. Suddenly to bring a breakthrough. Suddenly to open up a door. Suddenly to reverse the pile of debt. Suddenly to roll off the contempt that's been over you. Suddenly to bring you into your destiny. Suddenly to bring you the person of your dreams. If you believe in the suddenness of God, I need you in every location to lift your voice and give God some praise. He's the suddenly God. Suddenly. In fact, that's a promise for somebody here. As they reached the edge of that Jordan, though, the challenge was that they were more familiar with their adversity than they were with their destiny. They felt more comfortable as a slave than they did as a king. They were more used to oppression than they were used to freedom. Twelve spies were sent over. We read of them today, and we read that for ten of these spies, what God had for them appeared ridiculous, ludicrous, Enormous, foreboding, absolutely out of the park. And the truth is, it was for them, their promise. I mean, God promised them that land through Abraham and confirmed it again and again and again and again for 690 years. Yet they walked around in it. And as they saw their destiny, they couldn't wrap their minds and hearts around it. And guys, we're here today to prepare a promised land possessing generation. And I want you to know that it is no different for any one of us than it is for them as it was for them. We have a challenge too to wrap our minds and our hearts around what God is planning to give to us in our future. The difference between those who step into the promised land and those who don't is often going to come back to those who can wrap their minds and hearts around what God has for them in the days to come. Our problem is not that we don't dream too much. It's that we don't dream enough. We need more dreamers, more more comprehenders. The Apostle Paul literally said in Philippians 3, could you just chuck the verse up on the screen? The verse that Apostle Paul said, he said in the preceding statement, he said, this one thing I do. And then Philippians 3.12, he said, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. He said, my number one goal in my life is to to make sure that I get my mind and my heart around what God has for me. That's what he's saying here. This word take hold in the original Greek, geek, Greek, Greek, geek, geek, I'm a Greek geek. In the original Greek, it means to comprehend, to understand. And he said, this is what I'm doing in my life, guys. My number one goal is I just want to, I just want to, I want to understand it. I want to. I want to know it. Before it's ever real in my life, I want, to, I, want to, I want to see it. I want to comprehend it. He said, I'm not, and not just my dream. He said, I want to comprehend. I want to understand. I want to know what God has already seen and understood. Oh, I don't know if you get it, but the Bible tells us in Psalm 139 that before you were ever a twinkle in your father's eye, that every day of your life was ordained by God and written in a book. God isn't surprised when you walk into your destiny. God isn't blown away when suddenly doors open for you. God already wrote that page, destined your life, put favor over you. God's got something good ahead. If you believe it, could you praise God right now? And Paul is tapping into this into a New Testament context. And he's saying, God has already understood me. And he said, I want to understand what he understands about me. He's saying, I want to know what God knows about me. I want to grab what God's already grabbed inside of me. I want to know that promise and have it live on the inside of my life. And the problem, the problem, the problem is so often we don't take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold. Somewhere in the flicker of your life and the ether out there comes this promise in a moment of worship where you truly believe you're alive for a reason. And for most people, they let the ether come and the ether go. And Paul said, my worship of Jesus doesn't lead me to be trivial about his voice when it comes to me in a dream. He said, my worship of Jesus leads me to grab 
the things that come to me, the promises that come to me from God and to make them so central to my life. The Apostle Paul is the guy who literally stood before kings and rulers and throne rooms and parliament buildings. He's the guy who sowed the seed of evangelism for the reason why we now have a Christian West. He shared his testimony in Rome, and within a 100 years, a Caesar became a Christian, and the world became Christian. He sowed the greatest seeds of evangelism anybody's ever faced. He faced persecution. He faced trial. They stoned him, and he got back up. They put him in prison, and he wrote letters to churches. How, how can a guy I do that with his life. The truth is, my friends, when he walked into the throne room, he wasn't walking into a place he hadn't been before. He was walking into the dream God already had. And what we need is a generation who can take hold of that dream. Paul gave us the how, by the way, in, in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12, he said, now I see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. And this is the problem with our generation. We are a mirror selfie me generation. He said, now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. And here's the danger. Because you're going to live your life and you're going to interact with people and you're going to see what they want you to see about them. And then you're going to go home and you're going to look in the mirror. And what you see about you is everything you don't want them to see about you. He said, now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror, but then we shall see face to face. So we've got a clue. If I'm looking to discover who I am and what God has for me, I'm not going to find it when I'm on a navel-gazing search for me. And I'm not going to find it when I'm on a search to look at myself in the mirror and get the right angle for my selfie. We're not going to do that. We're going to find who God has called us to be when we find it in the face of Jesus. We don't need a reflection. We need an image of Christ. See, friends, the Bible says, Paul said in the second stanza of the scripture, he said, now I know in part, I know a little bit of my destiny and I know a little bit of my failure and I know a little bit of my talent and a little bit of my potential. He said, but then we shall know fully. I'll know everything about me because I am fully known. Can you link these two scriptures together? I want to comprehend what God comprehends about me because God fully knows me and fully understands me. And he said, the way that I'm going to get an understanding of who, I don't even know if I can preach this right. I, I, do, I just don't even know if I can land it right. Can you, can you try and just stay with it? Because he's saying, he's saying, if I could just get into the face of God, God knows everything about me. And if I could then get into his face and discover what he has for me and make it mine and get it deep on the inside of me, then I can walk in the fullness of his will because I'm not going to freak out when my destiny starts to unravel. I'm going to walk into the will of God. I need a hundred people to praise God if you believe that's true. He said, I've got to get it deep on the inside of me. Okay, so let's go back to these spies. The Bible tells us these 10 spies are sent to survey the land that is on the other side of the Jordan. This is the mandate. Check out the fruit. Check out the fields. Check out the soil. Check out the cities. Moses is thinking, I want to know what, what ranch is going to be mine, you know. I want to know what lifestyle block I'm going to live on. Check it out. And by the way, while you're there, check out the people who live there. But this is what the Bible says when the 10 came back. I want, I want to read it to you. Just, just, you can stay seated, but here we go. It says in verse 27, they came back and they said to Moses, we went into the land and it flows with milk and honey. Here's its fruit. But the people, this is what they were, they were told to check out the soil, the land, the crops, bring back the fruit, check out the houses. And by the way, while you're there, make note of the people. Listen to what they said. They said, we got the fruit. It's awesome. The land flows with milk and honey, but the people, the people, the people are powerful. We saw the descendants of Anak there, people. The Amalekites are there, people. Hittites, people. Jebusites, people. Amorites, people. Canaanites, people. Verse 31, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. They said all the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. The people, the people, the people, the people, the people, the people, the people. They were walking into their destiny. They were literally walking into what God had promised for them. But what they saw was not what God wanted them to use this 40 days as an opportunity to take it on board like 
Caleb did. That's my mountain. One day I'm going to live there. Oh my gosh, I can't believe it. An already fortified city, that's going to be my home. He wanted them to see those crops and say, thank you for sowing those because I'm about to reap them. But they walked in there and because they'd lived the last 400 years with a dual reality, with two identities, they walked in there unsure, am I God's child or am I the reject? And looking in the faces of who? The people. The reject won and God's child died. And friends, this is the same with every single one of us. We are a generation that has become a people comparative generation. Come on, you know this is true, right? People watching is a thing now. It's a thing. Like we do this. What do you like to do? I like to sit in cafes and people watch. I like to do that when it's bucketing with rain and you can get a seat right in the window and you get to watch people trying to dash across the road and you're enjoying a nice hot drink and it's freezing five degrees outside. You're like, thank God that ain't me. <laughs> Sadistic and mean, you, you might say, but you don't know the pressure I face. <laughs> Give me my trivial humor. But we're a generation of people watchers, of social media stalkers, yeah. of Instagram influencers which I'm pretty sure in the original Greek means lady with next to no clothing on, taking as many scantily clad photos as possible. And lo and behold, we've already known this for thousands of years, lots of people will put their attention where there is a woman with a little clothing on. But we call them an Instagram influencer. That bit was free. I feel better getting off my chest. And we wonder why we are full of timidity and fear. Because we are like the 10 spies looking at the faces of everybody around us and then losing the understanding of the uniqueness God has placed on the inside of us. I'm not going to find who God has called me to be when I'm looking at who He's made you to be. And by the way, if I'm looking at you, all you're going to show me is the projection you want me to see. Oh, you're going to work that outfit to cover me? Look at me. I've gained a lot of weight. Well, I haven't been that well this summer, but I've got a baggy t-shirt, so rock on, bad boy. You can't tell. I'm not wearing anything tight. I'm not letting you see my little food, baby. I'm going to tuck that sucker in, put a baggy t-shirt on. You might even think I'm thin. And then you're going to go home and look in the mirror, and you're going to see you, warts and all, right? And I'm going to compare myself in the mirror to the projection of everybody else and I'm going to devalue me and I'm going to overvalue everybody else and God doesn't want you to be one of the 10 spies wandering around in the wilderness seeing everybody else's favor and everybody else's blessing and what God's got in store for them. No, God wants you to be a Joshua and a Caleb. Not focused on the people. Not focused on somebody else. He doesn't want you looking down the nose at your own potential and destiny. No. God wants you walking into your promises and looking at it and saying, this is what God ordained for my life. I've already caught it in His presence. And now I'm walking in it in the real world. Give God some praise if you believe that right now. Ho. Oh. See, when you read the words of Joshua and Caleb and compare it, by the way, this sermon, I forgot to tell you, is called The Land and the People. Because the people were the focus of the ten. And the land was the focus of the two. And in and, and verse, in chapter 13, this is what Caleb said. Caleb said, we should go up and take possession of the land. For we can certainly do it. He didn't even mention the people. In, verse, in chapter 14, he said, the land we pass through. You can kind of hear it like, like, I don't know where these losers have been. But the land we pass through, Joshua and me, is exceedingly good. It flows with milk and honey. It's absolutely phenomenal. The Lord is pleased with us, and He's going to give it to us. And friends, this is the thing. We need a generation of people who've learned how to get an understanding of who they are from the presence and power of God. We need a generation. We don't need a generation of people 
who are living their lives distant from God, looking in the mirror, absorbed with comparison. We need a generation that are trading comparison for encounter. We need a generation that aren't looking their lives through the lens of Facebook. We need a generation that are getting into his book. I know it's an old joke, but I'm an old man. We need a generation that aren't walking through the course of their lives like this. Oh, oh, oh look at your shoes. Oh, oh, look at your life. Oh, 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 you, 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 you. Oh, no, little insignificant me. We need a generation who stopped looking around to everybody around them. We need a generation who don't look in the mirror of God's word and forget who they are. We need a generation who are going, you know what? There's no other place that I'm going to get an understanding of my identity than to pour my heart and my life into this book. This book's going to tell me who I am. Oh, I'm a conqueror. I'm an overcomer. I'm a blood-bought child of God. I'm the head and not the tail. Are you joking? I'm above only and not beneath. I'm led in triumphal procession in Christ. Jesus has already overcome every obstacle, defeated every foe, healed every sickness in my body, brought me into every plan and purpose that He has for me. I need to get my face out of people comparison and I need to get my heart into the Word of God. We need a generation that aren't just doing this. Flick, 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 double tap, flick, flick, double tap, flip, flip. Double tap, double tap, double tap, double tap. Your life, your life, your life, your life. We need a generation that have got less flicking and less lifting. We need more lifting my hands to Jesus, standing in the presence of the Most High God, hearing the voice of the Almighty and getting an understanding of who He has called me to be. We need a generation that can find the throne room of the Most High so He can show us who He's called us to be.